morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone, especially all of you here and also on live stream. It's uh, great to be back here again today and speaking to you. Uh, thank you, Brother Neil. That was awesome. Uh, we're going to continue kind of the topic of what we have uh, on the screen behind us is following the master discipleship. I just wanted to share some thoughts with you today. Uh, this is going to be kind of a 30,000 foot view flyover of the biblical narrative. Now, uh, I don't, I'm not asking for seatbelts like uh, Rick did. Uh, this is an unseatbelted flight. We will be making some stops. So it's not a, we're not, do, this is not a driving through look at the Bible because that would take months and years. And uh, I get 30 minutes, so I'm going to take all 30. So, um, but this is going to be kind of a fun thing for you. Now, I, Glenna and I like watching, watching the, uh, the show Why Planes Crash. And it's always awesome to me that the pilots, <laughs> they, they're flying right to the time that they crash. So I'm going to fly this plane, this sermon, right down to the point of crashing. So I'm going to, let's make it, let's make it a good one. But, uh, Yes. Um, I do want to say thank you to the Blakes. The Blakes uh, were, were sharp enough to get some of the, uh, the Lord's Supper emblems as we went into the pandemic. And we've rode those things to the last bit. So thank you, Chuck and Lisa, for doing that. It's awesome. Because I have ordered backup ones. And I just keep getting, when, when was the next date that are going to come? This week. They're going to come this week. So, yay. That's awesome. All right. So let's jump into the lesson, shall we? Um, so we have this theme of following uh, the steps of the master and discipleship. And I just wanted to really give you basically the gospel message. Why do you want to follow the steps of the master? Why? And uh, there's very good reasons. And I think Neil told us the rest of the story. But I'm going to give you some of the background of the story to give you a reason why you want to follow the steps of the master and be a disciple of him. Um, we're going to be reading really just three readings today. So if you're at home and you want to follow along, we're going to be in the Gospel of John chapter 14. So you can turn there. Uh, towards the end of our lesson, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 28. And then also Colossians, the first and second chapter. So just those, really those three readings. The rest of the time, I'm going to try and be a storyteller. So let's start off with John, the Gospel of John. And Jesus makes a very definitive statement, a definitive statement that the, the whole biblical narrative backs up and it, and it supports, but I want you to hear the statement and then we're going to go back and understand why Jesus could say so definitively these things. So John chapter 14 verses 1 through 6 says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, and this is the definitive statement that I want you to take with you. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. That is a very radical statement that Jesus is basically saying, if you want to get connected to your creator, there is one path, one way, and that is through me. And I want to share with you just the biblical narrative that supports Jesus' assertion and why I'm saying to you today, if you're not following Jesus, you can do that today. You can, you can confess him as your savior. You can repent, change from being serving yourself and be baptized today and know that you have a relationship with your with your your creator you're forgiven of all your sins and and the very illogical thing that that Neil said is that we should have been left to our own devices we should have been left to our own choices because we've made bad choices and why God decided to save us is because he loves us so much 
And so you can be free from that type of thinking that I have to save myself. You don't have to save yourself. You can follow the steps of the master and know that you have a relationship with your creator. And that is the biblical message. So if you would, come with me on this journey. We're going to just do a 30,000 foot flyover of the biblical narrative of how we get to Jesus saying that. Okay? So in Genesis, I'm going to start right there. God creates man, puts him in the garden. God loves man so much that you know what he gives man? He gives man liberty and free choice. He says, you can, this is garden. I love you, man. Here's this idyllic place for you to live. I just ask one thing, that you stay away from this tree of knowledge, good and evil. You can eat of anything else, but I'm giving you the choice. And unfortunately, man chose to rebel against God. And when he rebelled against God, what happened? I got my, do I have my kids in here? That they, they tried, the man, Adam and Eve, what did they cover themselves with? Yes, the fig leaves. And God came to them and said, you're improperly covered. What did he do? He covered them with what? Animal skins. So that's the first, that's the first kind of insight into what it was going to take for the atonement for rebelling against God. It kind of gives us a little bit of insight of what we need to see and what we ultimately see with Jesus. So God, so the, God expels him from the garden, and um, it it doesn't take long now that God has this, he, from the very beginning He's had this plan. It's created this mystery, basically this mystery. Of how is God going to resolve this separation of? Him from his creation. That is a mystery that is go that the that the prophets and all of the biblical narratives like what is this mystery? How is God going to resolve this problem of sin? And to Neil, Neil's point, it's unthinkable because it was a mystery because they never would have thought that how God would have done it. But that's what started out. So um, so we quickly see as man is out in the garden, we see the story of Cain and Abel. Right? And Cain is doing wrong, and, and God says, look, you know, I, I see your countenance has fallen. You know, sin is crouching at the door, and it's desirous for you, but what? You must master it. This has been the essential tension of living in a physical world. We have sin, its influence on us, and we needed to master it. And unfortunately, Cain chose wrong. The world from that point quickly descends into rebellion against God. In Genesis 6, we read that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And in chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 5, it says, I'll blot man out whom I created from the face of the land. I'm sorry I've made him. The earth was corrupt in the sight of God and filled with violence. Once man broke that covenant with God and sin was polluted into, uh, into the consciousness of man, the world descended into chaos really quickly, into violence and rebellion against God. And so then we have the story of Noah. Noah found grace in God. Noah, was, Noah wasn't perfect, but Noah was one that respected God and followed God. And Noah obeyed God, and Noah, in this really tragic flood story of of destruction of the earth. Noah and his wife and his sons and his wives, eight souls were saved at that time. After Noah, we see now God brings into the narrative Abraham, or Abram. And then he makes a promise to Abram, to Abraham. He says, one, I'm going to make you a great nation. Two, I'm going to bless those that bless you, and there's a promise of land. And three, through him, all nations of the earth would be blessed. So now we're starting to get a little bit of a hint of the answer to the mystery of how God was going to resolve this. So Abram, or Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac gets those same three promises, the promises of land, the promises of a, a great nation of land, and also that, that through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. 
And then we see Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And do, are, for my kids that are here, do you guys remember the story of Jacob and Esau? That Esau was, was very hairy. And, and do you recall the story of, of Esau uh, selling his birthright? Or Jacob, yeah, Esau selling his birthright to Jacob? You guys remember that? In Miss, Miss Alicia's class? And so Jacob then becomes the favored one. And Jacob has a relationship with God. His name is changed to Israel, right? And so that's where we get Israel. Israel, then Jacob has, how many sons does Jacob have? You know, Jacob has 12 sons. And those 12 sons become, ultimately become the 12 tribes. So now, to kind of get it to where Miss Alicia is in her class right now, is Jacob has these 12 sons, but there's one son that he really likes. Who is that? That's Joseph, right? Joseph, he gets this special coat, and uh, his, his brothers don't like him a whole lot because he's kind of the favorite one, and, and, uh, and Joseph also has the irritating habit of sharing the dream that he is going to be like over his brothers. And his brothers don't like that at all. And so they are planning not just to, to just sell him off. The original plan is to what? To kill him. But, so Joseph comes out. He's got his coat on. And here's this dreamer of dreams. And so um, the oldest, I believe it's Reuben, he wants to save Joseph from this fate of being killed. And so he says, let's, let's throw him in a pit. Okay. And then so they throw him in the pit, and Reuben's thinking, okay, I'm going to just come back and save him later. But along the way, I think Judah gets the idea, you know what? Let's get some profit off of this kid. I don't like him anyway. So they sell him off into slavery, and Joseph is off into slavery. And that seems like, wow, what a cruel thing to happen to Joseph. But Joseph, because he's obedient to God, because he stays obedient to God, every situation that he is put in, he is caused to pro prosper. And ultimately, he becomes, and I told you it's a 30,000 foot flyover because I can't get all the details in, but ultimately he becomes the second in command of all of Egypt. And the way that he does that is he interprets the dream of the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh dreamt a dream of these seven fat cows and then these seven emaciated cows coming and eating the fat cows and and joseph was able to tell him hey that's seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine and no one else could have figured that out and so pharaoh makes joseph second to him in all of egypt and so as the famine years come in joseph's brothers who think that he's long gone and joseph's father jacob israel believes he's dead they, Jacob, Israel, sends the brothers off to Egypt. Say, go get some grain. We're starving. So they come into Egypt. Ultimately, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and says, I know that you, call, you want it to be harm to me, but God caused, what, but God knew that it was for good, that many lives were going to be saved by putting me in this position. And so... The Pharaoh at that time brings, says to Jacob, and says, bring all your brothers, bring them all in, and they can live here in Egypt. Now, Egyptians weren't all that, that friendly. They're like, okay, well, you're shepherds. We don't really want you living amongst us, so go live out kind of in the outer pasture lands. And so they left them out there, and they flourished. They grew, and they became what? was going to be just a nomadic small group of, of a family into a mighty force. These 12, they became 12 tribes of people, right? And so they grew to this mighty force to where the Egyptians now start fearing like, wow, <laughs> these people that are living kind of in the outskirts of us, they are getting so large and so strong and are so blessed that they might, you know, come together with a, another fighting force and overtake us. So what do they do? What did, what did the Egyptians do to the Israelites' children? Do you know? They put them into slavery. That's right. They enslaved them. In fact, the Pharaoh tells the Hebrew midwives, hey, what I want you to do 
is when you see the Hebrew women having boys, I want you to kill the boys as they're born. But the Hebrew women refuse to do that. They're not going to do that. And Pharaoh calls them in and says, wait, wait a second, I told you to do this. Why didn't you do this? And the Hebrew midwife just said, look, the, 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 the Hebrew women are just, they're so robust, they, they have the baby before we even get there. And God blessed them for that because they refused to do uh, this, uh, uh, this horrible thing. And so they continued to grow. Well, it came a point where a Pharaoh who did not, yeah, this, this Pharaoh who did not know Joseph when he did, um, he's, he's, you know, he's trying to suppress them and he, he just uh, enslaves them to a point of for 400 years, they're just enslaved and, uh, and calling out to God. And along the way, a beautiful baby is born to one of the Hebrew women. She nurtures him for several months, but at some point she can't hide it anymore. So she puts the little baby in a basket and floats it over the reeds. And Pharaoh's daughter, it was very strategic. They knew Pharaoh's daughter was going to be at the Nile, so they're very strategic about it. They put the baby in the basket, and they knew that Pharaoh's daughter was going to be there. And she finds the baby. And he's beautiful, and one of the Hebrew women was watching. She says, can I, can I help you with this baby? We can maybe nurse this baby. She says, yes. And so she takes this baby in as her own son, Moses. And so Moses now is raised as an Egyptian, but knowing his Hebrew roots. For 40 years, he's among them. And at some point in, he, in his life, when he's 40 years old, he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. And he looks left and he looks right and he's thinking, I'm not going to put up with that. And he kills the Egyptian. Well, that becomes known to Pharaoh. And Moses has to split. He's got to get out of town. So he gets out of town, not for a year, not for two years. You don't know how long Moses was out of town for? 40, 40 years. 40 years he's away. He's thinking, I'm done. I was, I was at the pinnacle of leadership in Egypt. I had all this influence. And now I'm an 80-year-old guy who works with sheep. <laughs> Where's my influence, right? And God says, no. I'm going, to, I'm going to make you a powerful influence for me. So what I'm telling you now, just as, little, as we land here a little bit, decide, I don't care how old you are, where you're at in your life span right now, you can be a powerful influence for bringing people to God. Moses was 80 years old and done. And he came back and became a powerful influence in, the, in, in biblical history. So now we get to where Miss Alicia is now. Moses comes in and he tells that Pharaoh, based on God's command, he says, I want you to let my people go worship me. And Pharaoh is not used to being told what to do. And he's like, no, no way. And so in that process, God, through Moses and Aaron, Moses' brother, bring ten plagues upon the Egyptians, one at a time, one at a time, each time bringing more and more misery to the Egyptians. And each one of those plagues really was kind of representative of things that the Egyptians worshipped, the Nile and, and, and the sun and and these frogs and other things. And God's like, okay, you want to worship frogs? I'm going to give you frogs. I'm going to give you lots of frogs to worship. And he just overruns them with frogs. You want to worship the sun? Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to blot the sun out. You're going to have no dark. You're going to have darkness, right? And so finally, it comes to the last one where Moses said, you know, let, let my people go. And the Pharaoh's, no. And so this one is going to be the death angel. And uh, this really is something that a lot of people don't even understand today. Passover, the Passover lamb. And so with, and I want to connect that to, to Jesus in, in my narrative here. But even today, I was talking to one of my employees, and he's like, Dan, we're driving together, and we're driving off to this job, you know, 100 miles away up in Oxnard. And he's like, and it was Passover time. He goes, I don't even know. He goes, I've done Passover. My, I've, got, I've got some Jewish people in my family. He goes, I don't even know what Passover is. It's just become just a word, right? 
And so I was able to share with him. I said, no, you know what this is? This is when in Egypt, Moses told his people, told the Israelites, look, if you want to be saved from the death angel, you are to, on the 10th day of Nisan, you're going to select a lamb or a goat. You're going to kill that lamb. And on, you're going to, well, you're going to observe it for four days. And on the 14th day at twilight, you are going to kill that lamb. You're going to eat all of it. You're going to take the blood. You're going to put it over your door frame. And that blood will re represent protection against death. And those Hebrews did that. They did that. And so what the Passover is, if you're even wondering at home, it's that if that blood was over your door frame, the death angel passed over you, did not bring death to your firstborn in your family. And so when, when, the, when the death angel came to Egypt, that was it. The, all the Egyptians were like, get these people out of here. They're pouring gold on them. They're saying, go, take, take everything. <laughs> they were apparently taking the microphones too. <laughs> can't write this stuff anyways so they they're, they're giving them gold just get out of here and so the, they, they leave rushed out of the land and Pharaoh basically has a change of heart chases after them Moses is parting the Red Sea right kids and he, go, he brings the, the, the Hebrews across on dry land Pharaoh chases after them, and what happens, kids? Did you learn that today, Miss Alicia? Yeah. What happened to the, the Egyptians? They drowned. They drowned. That's right. The Red Sea crashed down on them, and they were and the, the Hebrews were saved. And so, from that point, Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai. He obtains the Ten Commandments. Let me get through all my notes here. And he's asked to lead the people into the new land. They're going to get this land promise, right? There's a, he's already given them, so Phil, the, the, you're going to be a great nation. Now he's giving them a land promise. And there's still yet to be that promise of all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. So now it's the land promise. So now he's got Moses leading the people to the land. Unfortunately, Moses, Moses doesn't get to go in, but, jo but Joshua goes in, right? Uh, they send, well, let me just get this because this is really important. Twelve spies are sent to the land. Ten of them come back and say, we can't do it. It's too big a job. Can't do it. Two, Joshua and Caleb said, if God's on our side, we can do anything. So I would say, take that with you too. If God's on your side, you can, don't be one of the ten. Be one of the Joshua's, Caleb's. When we're talking about discipleship, you can do it. This is a very, this story of, of, of redemption is a beautiful story. It is life changing to people. You just, you start talking to some of the people in this room and the people that they've talked to and, and brought out of the world into uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ and it's an amazing transformation. And so I would say, don't be one of the 10, be a Joshua, be a Caleb, be bold. Don't be afraid to tell this story because it is amazingly changing. So Joshua ultimately, the, the, the people are wandered for 40 years because they didn't obey God. Ultimately they go into the land. They don't expel everyone out of the land. And, uh, and unfortunately they, uh, there's a, a group of, uh, of the Hebrews at some point a nation or, or a generation is raised up that what? That doesn't know God. And that is, uh, that is an indictment of the generation prior that did not tell them about God, right? And so that's why we're so important for us to be engaged with our kids, to be engaged in teaching so that a generation doesn't follow this generation that doesn't know God. That's what we're doing here every week is we're making sure that we're passing it on to the next generation so that we don't have this issue that happened in the judges. So basically what would happen is 
the Hebrews would fall into idolatry and worshiping the Baals and just doing everything and rebelling against God. And God would send them a judge. And that judge would bring them back in and then they would be blessed and they'd fall back into idolatry and a judge would come in and bring them back. So, and ultimately, we, have, we get to Samuel. And, and the people then at that point, what do they want? They don't want a judge anymore. They want a king. They want a king because they want to look like all the other nations around them. They want a king. And God tells Samuel's like, God, they're rejecting me as the judge. He goes, no, no, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me because they want a king. So I'm going to give them a king, but I'm going to warn them about what a king's going to do. And so he does. But so ultimately you have King Saul, right? Saul, basically for time's sake, Saul sins and he's, re he's removed. And then there's David and then David's son Solomon. And then Solomon has his son Rehoboam, and then Rehoboam really messes it up. Rehoboam is so heavy-handed with the people that he ends up splitting the nation of Israel, the Hebrews. And Jeroboam takes them up north, Rehoboam stays south, and now they're split. And they're no longer the fighting force that they were because now they're split, right? Ultimately, that northern kingdom is taken in, is taken captive by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom is taken over by the Babylonians in 500. And the, and the temple of Solomon, that beautiful temple that Solomon builds, is destroyed. And so that's the first temple that's destroyed. And so then we have basically a series of kings, good and bad. And that's where all the prophets come in. The prophets prophesied to those kings, saying, get back to God. Get back to God. Learn. Be, get back to the the." the sacrificial system get back to worshiping God that's what the prophets called them to do and so that is basically the Old Testament narrative then we have about 400 years of biblical silence where we have multiple kingdoms that come together I won't go through all of it ultimately we get to the first century Roman the Roman domination now as we as the New Testament opens up the Jews are really basically captive at the Ro Roman rule. Rome rules everything. You have the major players, see if I have it here, the politically you have the, the, the Caesar is Tiberius, you have Herod as the king of the area, but he answers to Rome, the governor Pilate, you have Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin. This is where we see, basically, this is the political landscape that Jesus is born into. So the New Testament opens up, with the birth of Jesus, the, the, the narrative in the first part of Matthew is that Mary, a young woman betrothed to Joseph, not married yet, is found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is born through Mary, and he's raised, and he starts his ministry. And for 30, for, for up to about age 30, about three years, Jesus is has his ministry, and he's mainly up in the northern part of, of the country, but he is... He's deliberately making a direct move down into Jerusalem. And his disciples knew that this was very dangerous because the political landscape was such that, boy, to go into Jerusalem and to challenge that authority at that time was very dangerous because anybody that was seen thought to be in rebellion to Tiberius Caesar would be put to death. And so Jesus... Then on, he directly comes into Jerusalem, and now he's going to confront these, these uh, Jewish leaders in his Passover. Now, remember our story from the Ten Commandments, the Passover lamb. When you read in, in the Gospel of John, what is John? John the Baptist, he's out baptizing, and he's telling people to turn towards God. And, what is, and, and John sees Jesus coming to him. And what does John proclaim about Jesus? He's like, Here, this is the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world. And so that's going to connect us back to that Passover, right? That Jesus is, how is, how is Jesus going to be the Lamb of God? What does that mean? Well, Jesus comes in to Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. Comes in and he's celebrated. And then he's examined for these four days. Ultimately, the Jewish leadership, they are so jealous of him and so threatened by him because Jesus has got a, a tremendous following because in those three years, he preached, he taught, 
He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. And he even raised the dead. And so he was a mighty force. And he came in and he questioned what they were doing in the temple. The temple, temple worship, and temple, the, the time of, of, of Jesus in that first century had become so corrupt that the temple, you had the temple tax. You had basically people would come from all over to come to celebrate Passover. And they would bring their sacrifices. And the temple folks would say, I'm sorry, that, that sacrifice doesn't look good enough to me. You're going to have to buy one from me. And so here's one. Oh, well, I can't take that money. That's foreign money. You need to, you need to have temple money. Oh, oh, there, oh there's, not a, there's a very heavy exchange rate for that. So you get half value in that. And so the people were not at all at love with what was going on at the temple. They were not. And these leaders, these Jewish leaders, understood that their place in the nation, in even the Roman, was, was at threat. And so they came to the governor, Pilate, and they said, we want to arrest this Jesus. And they, they trumped up a false charge of saying that he was saying he was going to be a king. Because they knew if they threatened Pilate enough, that Pilate would have no choice but to eliminate him. Because Pilate, his life's on the line. If he, if he allows an insurrection in Jerusalem, he's going to be dead. And so, basically, the leaders say, hey, this Jesus, he, he says he's going to be king. And, the, he's, and, and they said, well, it, basically, it said, we have no king but Caesar. They're, they're just basically, they're selling out to this because they're so concerned about getting rid of Jesus. So Jesus, ultimately, at twilight, as the Passover lambs were being killed, Jesus dies on the cross. He comes into the tent. He's examined just like the Passover lamb. He's, he's, he's examined for four days. He's crucified. His blood is shed. And at twilight, as, they were, as the Passover lambs were dying, Jesus was dying as well. Three days later, the difference between anything was that Jesus was raised from the dead. And we're going to go right there. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Let's read. We're almost done, so stay with me. Matthew 28, starting in verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he was lying. Now let's go down to uh, chapter, uh, same chapter, verse 16. Let's see. Uh, verse 16, but the, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus, when he says that there is no, back in, in, over in our first verse, when Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but through me, it is by virtue of what he accomplished on the cross. It is by virtue of his blood being shed. And that we're no longer having to pay the price, as Neil indicated. That's what should have happened. We should have been left to our own devices. But God loved us so much that he paid the price for us. He raised, and what he said, he called us to make disciples, to tell people about him. One final verse as we close today, it just has to do with this whole idea of the mystery. Let's see if I can distill it down here. This is... Uh, 
Colossians chapter 1, we'll start in verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, and is beginning the firstborn from the dead, so he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fulfillment to dwell in him, fullness to, to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or the things in heaven, and although you were formerly aliens and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, you've now been reconciled, you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you, you before him holy and blameless beyond reproach let's see so for time's sake we're going to go down to verse 25 of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages in generations but have now been manifested to his saints to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, in the hope of glory, we proclaim him. So we are complete in Jesus Christ. That is, that's why we want to follow the steps of the master. From Genesis through all the way to here, that it is the biblical narrative that God was not going to hold us responsible for, for being rebellious to him. That he was going to send his son, and his son paid the price for us. So I'm telling you today... If you have not obeyed Jesus Christ, if you've not taken him on, if you've not confessed him, you can do that today. You can have today as your spiritual birth by confessing Jesus, repenting from serving yourself and the world and the world's way of doing it, and we'll baptize you today into Jesus Christ. And if that is, is, you're buried with him just like he was in death and raised with him just the newness of life. That would be a beautiful thing. That is the lesson. So let's be, let's be not the 10, let's be the two. Let's be the Joshua and Caleb's. Let's be the ones that are bold. Let's be the Moseses of the world to say, you know what? It's never too late to, to be an impactful in the kingdom. All right, let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so fortunate to live in this time where we have your complete message. We, we understand we have access to it in so many languages, Father. We thank you for it. We pray uh, earnestly that we just uh, are bold in uh, our faith, that we can be good disciples of you, follow you, and really um, share with others this wonderful good news that people do not have to live in trying to perfectly follow some adherence to some idea of goodness, but it's about your grace and your mercy, and it's about your son and his blood and our salvation through that. We thank you. We praise you for that. We pray that you be with us this week, that we might just really have open eyes and open ears for opportunity to share our faith, to serve others, and uh, to bring uh, goodness and light into people's life. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.